we are going, Ashley, I'm going to go ahead and we're in the chat. Yes. In the chat, it's from Rhonda. Um, so chat will be down at the bottom. If you just click that, it should come up on the right side. Well, it comes up on the right side of my screen. I don't know where it comes up for everybody Did it else. send to everybody or just the um, host? It, it should have been sent to everybody. And did it come through? Uh -oh. Rhonda, do you want to go ahead and send that again? Mm -hmm. I will try. Let me see. In, I that little, in that little blue thing, there you we might go. just have to change it to everyone instead of to... Oh, here, let me see. Hosts. Everyone in the meeting. How about now? Can you guys see it? Yep. Oh. Perfect. Yep. Okay. I won't send it again then. Okay. Um, we are also recording this just so you guys are aware. Um, so that we can post it up onto Mylene Body Boot Mylene Body Boot Camp's uh, YouTube channel, so that we can kind of reference it and send people there in the future. Um, and just like give people a heads up, letting them know that that is going to happen. Um, so Rhonda, if you want to go ahead and share your share screen, screen, we will go ahead and get this party started. Hopefully people can see that. Give me the <clears throat> thumbs up or the thumbs down or. It looks good to me, I can okay. see it. All right, great, 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 great. Okay, I think everybody. Okay, whoops, 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 whoops. You wanna go ahead and get started, Ash? I, I will gladly go ahead and get started. And, intro. My name is Ashley Davis, for those of you who don't know me, I am the owner of My Lean Body Bootcamp. I am so excited to have you all here with us this afternoon. Um, it is gonna be a great amount of information that you guys are gonna get. So please take those notes. Like I said, those handouts are in that chat um, space. So if you do um, have any questions, please reference those handouts. And also if you guys have questions while the presentation is going on. If you would please enter those questions into the chat area um, after each kind of natural breaking point um, of our uh, presentation, we are gonna kind of cover whatever questions came up during that portion. And so I will be checking that chat area for those questions. So if you have questions, please go ahead and put those in there. I'm going to hand it over to Rhonda. She's the one with all the knowledge and the one who's going to carry us through today. So Rhonda, all yours. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, thanks everybody for spending some of your Sunday afternoon with us. I really appreciate it. I'm Rhonda, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm Part of what I do with Ashley is I help, help coach at My Lean Body Boot Camp. I really enjoy it. It's not something I've always been. Um, my life prior to kids, I was actually a science teacher. And then I kind of had my own health re revolution, if you will. And, uh, and then I went into parenthood retirement and thought, you know, look, if this is a way I can help other people um, with some of the things I was struggling with, then it was a good fit for me. So I've been doing health coaching for um, going on three years now. And I, I love being able to share information like this. So thank you for spending your after some of your afternoon with us. Um, as sort of a Disclaimer, not sort of, as a disclaimer, as a health coach in the state of Illinois, I'm not legally able to give nutritional advice. So this class is for informational purposes only. Um, so if you'd like to change some things about your diet, please consult um, a medical professional for advice or a registered dietitian. So to make sure that this, uh, we understand that this is just for information. Okay, that being said, the topic of sugar. Very big topic that I want to cover today, and I'm going to do my utmost to be done in an hour because I know some people need to be someplace at three o'clock. And part of the struggle I had when I was putting together this information was, you know, it's hard to know um, what to include and what not to. But what, just to kind of give you an outline, what we'll go through at the beginning part here, I think it's important to go through what's happening in your body when we eat sugar because. By now, we've all received the, um, the, the message that we probably need to, to reduce the amount of sugar we're eating. But a lot of times, I think people don't understand why. And so I want to cover a little bit about what's happening in your body when you eat sugar. And then we'll break for questions. 
And then where do we find sugar in our food? And in that part, I'm also going to talk a little bit about artificial sweeteners. So that, that will be covered kind of in the middle part. And then we'll break for questions again. And then at the end, we'll give you some tips and ideas about how to go about reducing the sugar in the foods that you might be eating a lot of. Okay. So that's kind of an outline of where we're going. So let's get started. I wanna start first of all, looking at kind of taking this 30,000 foot view about where is sugar in the food that we eat? Because I think that's the part that sometimes can confuse people. And in doing so, I wanna step back even a little bit further and look at you know what comprises the food that we eat. And apologies if this is um, a little bit of a elementary education for some people, but I know, like I said, as a science teacher, I was not teaching this to my high school students when I was in the classroom. And so even if you did have the luxury of this kind of education, health education, you know, maybe it's been a while. So I hope this is just a good review. So if you look at it this way, food is made up of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And those are what we call the main macronutrients of food. Those are the uh, components of all the food that you eat. We use protein to build and repair, and that's things like chicken and steak and eggs and fish. We use fats to help us absorb vitamins. So we need the fats for our brain and our nerve cells. And, and we can also use fat for long-term energy, long energy. And that's things like butter and oil and avocados and coconuts and such. And then the big group in the middle is carbohydrates. And a lot of people don't realize or understand that fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables, are carbohydrates. And this is where we also include things like grains, oats, and corn, and rice, and quinoa. And then this is where the sugars that we'll be talking about in more detail are honey, but this is also where we need to include the refined flours and crackers and candies and soda and muffins and fries and pastas. And even we're gonna to touch on alcohol and other beverages. So as you can see, this carbohydrate group is, is large. And this is where the sugars are that we're gonna be talking about today. The thing that I think can confuse people is all food is made up of all of the three macronutrients and depending on the food. So for instance, chicken is a protein, but it has a little bit of fat in it. Now, if this were chicken thighs, it would have more fat, or if it was a ribeye steak, it would have more fat, but it's primarily a protein or we consider it a protein. Something like broccoli, as I mentioned, um, as a vegetable is a carbohydrate, but it has a little bit of protein in it. Eggs, again, they have a little bit of, of, of fat. Well, they're pretty much equal fat and protein if you eat the whole egg. Things like black beans and quinoa are primarily carbohydrates, um, but they do have some protein in it. And I think this gets confusing when people talk about having a vegan or a vegetarian diet and getting their protein from sources like black beans and quinoa. That can get confusing, but it's primarily a carbohydrate. An apple is primarily a carbohydrate. Milk, things like milk, again, can be a little bit confusing, but because of the sugar in milk, we can classify it pretty much mostly as a carbohydrate. And then of course it was skin milk, you wouldn't have any fat there. Peanut butter, a lot of people will eat peanut butter thinking they're getting a protein, and it does have some protein in it, but it's primarily a fat. And then something like an ice cream, that can be really confusing. And again, depending on the, the milk that they start with, it can have even more fat than that, but it's pretty much a carbohydrate. So that's an over overview of all food that I hope helps set the stage. Now let's just do a little bit of a deeper dive into carbohydrates, because remember that's that big section we're gonna be spending our time in this morning or this afternoon. So carbohydrates are made up of complex carbohydrates, which are the vegetables and the grains that we talked about and simple carbohydrates, and that's everything else. So when we look at complex carbohydrates, you might consider these to be the healthier carbohydrates, if you will, because 
they do have fiber in them, a, a good sources of fiber. They have phytonutrients, which are all those vitamins and minerals that we get from the colors of vegetables. They're prebiotic for our gut microbiome. They feed those good guys in our gut. Um, these, because they have fiber in them, digest more slowly. So we get a more sustained energy from them. And they don't have quite the impact on our blood sugar. Simple carbohydrates on the other hand, yes, there's some fiber in them when we're talking about fruit. There are some phytonutrients, those vitamins and minerals from fruit. They are quick to digest though. And that way they give us quick energy. And because of that, they have a quick impact on blood sugar. And a lot of you probably, maybe you've heard of or seen the glycemic index. And what we mean by the glycemic index then are just the simple carbohydrates digest quickly so they can have a quick impact on your blood sugar. And then the low glycemic index foods are the um, vegetables and the, and the grains. So they don't have quite the impact on blood sugar. So I wanted to throw that in there because sometimes that's also a confusing uh, idea for people. Okay, so sugar. Let's then look at what we're going to be talking about primarily what I'm talking today is are those simple sugars that um, have that fast impact on our blood sugar. And so when we look at what happens to our body when we eat these, well, all food, let's back up here just a second. When we eat all food um, in our small intestine, it gets absorbed. So that's the proteins, the carbs, and the fat get absorbed there. And the idea is that all of these things need to make it into our bloodstream. Okay, so now if we're looking at sugar specifically in our bloodstream, you're always going to have some sugar in your bloodstream, and we need that, but it's only about a teaspoon total. If you could take all of your sugar and just filter it out of your blood, it'd only be about a teaspoon. And for illustration purposes, I'm going to use this blood vessel, and the top line there is what we'll consider high blood sugar, high normal blood sugar. Anything above that is dangerous to the body. The bottom line is what we're going to be looking at as, as low normal blood sugar, and anything below that is also dangerous. So let's just look at a typical, maybe high, simple carbohydrate meal. And let's just call this breakfast. Let's say this is your first meal of the day and you eat at several simple carbohydrates. What's gonna happen is your blood sugar will spike because remember we said those are, they digest very quickly. And it goes above that high normal level to that dangerous. Well, in response to that, the body dumps out insulin and insulin works really well. So blood sugar starts to drop, but because insulin, there's so much that got dumped out, blood sugar keeps dropping to that below low normal level. And again, this is dangerous for the body. And maybe you've experienced this, that's that hangry feeling. The word hangry is so uh, popular right now. That's that you can't do anything until you eat. You just are obsessed by needing something to eat. Maybe it's about 10 o'clock in the morning and you're thinking, I need something to pick me up. I need a granola bar or a sweetened coffee or something. So you grab something like that, blood sugar spikes again to that dangerously high level. Insulin gets dumped out again. Insulin works really well. So it, it drops your blood sugar, but again, back to that below low normal level that's dangerous for the body. And this is around lunchtime. And you wanted to make some decent decisions for lunch, but instead you're just craving something like, um, I don't know, anything, French, fr anything fast, French fries, burger, shake, um, because you are in a hormonal position not to really want anything else because your, your body's saying, bring this blood sugar back up. So you have that for lunch. Again, blood sugar spikes to that dangerously high level. Insulin gets dumped out. Blood sugar drops back to that below low normal level to, to the, again, the dangerous level. And this is that two o'clock in the afternoon, pick me up where you want to get a muffin or some snacks the after school time you might feel nibbly or you just really want something. Blood sugar spikes again to that dangerous high level. 
insulin gets dumped out again. It falls down to this level. And this is dinner time. You were going to do something very healthy. And really all you can think about is grabbing whatever's fast. And that's, that happens over and over and over again. And it's a hard roller coaster to get off of. So let's just take a look at what blood sugar should do normally. What we would like it to do, instead of dumping a bunch of simple carbohydrates and sugars in at breakfast time, you combine that with, you know, some with have more fiber, some more complex carbohydrates and some protein and some healthy fats. Blood sugar is going to go up and it should. That's what blood sugar does after you eat, but not so much that insulin has to get dumped out. So you just have an appropriate amount of insulin come out. Blood sugar will come down as the cells open up and use what you've eaten, but it doesn't fall to that low below normal level because our body has a backup system Then I'm, I'm not gonna go into that this afternoon, but it has a way to keep blood sugar from dropping to that below low level. And it stabilizes it until it's time to eat again. And this is when at 10 o'clock or 11, you're like, oh, I'm hungry. You feel hunger in your belly, but not that crazy hunger. And you can, you're like, oh, I'm gonna finish this up and I'll have lunch. And at that point, we are in a, a, a stable position, blood sugar wise, to make a healthier choice. So I think that's a super important thing to understand as you're trying to get sugar out of your diet is that a lot of times we get, uh, we really beat ourselves up thinking I don't have enough willpower to make better decisions. But a lot of times we're just in that hormonal position with our blood sugar and we just don't make good choices because of our blood sugar. So I wanna make sure there's a clear understanding of that as far as what our bodies are doing when we eat sugar. Next thing, I'm going to touch on is what happens in our brains when we eat sugar. So we know it's, there's an impact on our blood sugar, but there's also an impact on our brains that it's very important to understand because sugar and those simple carbohydrates are our brain's preferred fuel. See our bodies, um, because they're so simple to digest and they digest so quickly, our body doesn't have to do a lot of work for those. And so our brain's like, you know, give me some of that stuff that's fast and easy because I've got uh, energy I need to put on other things. So first of all, your brains prefer those, those carb, simple carbohydrates. And then combine that with the fact that we are born with a predisposition to like sweet things. And if you're not familiar, <laughs> Breast milk is actually has a sweetness to it. And the reason for that is because when we taste sweet, we have a, a neurotransmitter that gets uh, released in our brains called dopamine. And dopamine is the hormone that makes us feel good and it kind of relaxes us. And it's also the hormone that teaches us to do that thing again. So it makes sense that you want a baby to taste something sweet so that we'll want to eat again and feed and, and um, thrive. The thing with sugar, uh, and this is the reward center that you can see lit up in our brains when we eat it, and that's that dopamine reward center that I was talking about, is this center will downregulate itself if it gets overstimulated a lot. And in downregulating, you'll need more sugar to taste the same sweet if it's used to getting a lot of that, which is a very similar response to you know, harder um, substances and more addictive substances like a cocaine. You need more to get that same feeling. Um, so essentially when people feel like they're addicted to sugar, a lot of times it is this reward center that's also playing a role in how you feel when you eat sugar and how you need more sugar over time. The last little bit before we break for um, some questions before we go into where sugar is in our food is I wanna just really briefly mention the idea of stress because stress is also plays a role in how we crave sugar. Because when we feel stress, whether it's real or imagined, our bodies think we need to fight something, we're gonna need to fight and then cortisol gets released. And cortisol is the hormone that helps you get ready for a fight. It's going to increase your blood sugar so that your muscles have 
energy. And in doing so, that can contribute to sugar cravings. So the three of these things together, when you've got the blood sugar up and down and up and down and up and down, plus the facts that our brain prefers simple carbohydrates and then the, the dopamine release that comes with that and stress, that gives us kind of a triple whammy as far as what's going on in our body with sugar. Now we know for the most part, we understand that you know, having too much sugar in our diet can, can lead to weight gain and ultimately type two diabetes. But what a lot of people may not understand over time, it also is becoming um, known that it's a contributing factor to high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and then symptoms together create this um, condition called metabolic syndrome. So a lot of um, people think, well, I just have high blood pressure and don't, aren't really making the connection to the sugar in their diet. But if you have three of the five of these conditions, so you, let's say you're not having any weight issues and you don't think you have any blood sugar issues, the other three conditions can also set you up for this metabolic syndrome. So again, I'm hoping that with some of that will help give you the why as to why we want to um, reduce the sugar that's in our diet and um, Help, help you make the behavior changes you want to, because I think that's important to set the stage. So questions there, anybody, Ash, does anybody have any questions that's come through? We did not know. receive any questions via the chat. So okay. you must be doing an absolutely sensational job <laughs> I don't know all that. of the information, uh -huh. um, which I know you always do. Uh, I always found this part of the presentation to be so informative as to helping me understand how what I eat impacts that um, blood sugar in my actual veins. I mean, I, I've, I've experienced high blood sugar and I've certainly experienced that low, low blood sugar where you get a little shaky and you're like, I just have to eat something. Um, so it was really helpful for me to really kind of imagine those food choices that I make um, and having those in having those images. So I think we can go ahead and move on. Oh wait, hold on. Is insulin re released every time you eat, even if it's just protein? Yes, yes. Um, the only place, um, and then, so insulin helps your cells open up to take the energy that we, w w that we eat. And protein, I won't go into it, but it, it actually gets broken down into a carbohydrate-like substance. The only thing that doesn't release insulin is fat. So that's why um, a lot of people will move to the, the ketogenic diet, which we, will, we won't get into that today, but fat is the one that doesn't release insulin. Good question, really good question. Great question, Fiona. Yeah. Anything else? Nope, that was the only one All I right. saw. All right, so let's look at then sugar in the food that we're eating. All right, so. This is fun. I thought it would be a neat time to just kind of take a quiz yourself. I, I wish I had the Jeopardy song, um, but I don't. So let's just take a real quick little quiz. And which has more sugar per serving? You can just quiz yourself. I'll give you a couple seconds. Is it gonna be a chocolate chip, a serving of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream or a lemon iced tea? Do, 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 just kidding. Yeah, it's the lemon iced tea, uh, almost over 10 grams more sugar. So next one, a chocolate croissant from Starbucks or Dannon with fruit on the bottom, Dannon yogurt with fruit on the bottom. Oh, yep, it's the Dannon, Dannon yogurt at oh, over twice over twice the amount of sugar. How about a uh, energy, a power bar, protein bar versus a Dunkin' Donuts jelly donut? It's the power bar. We're gonna talk more about these in a minute. Over, over twice, well, almost twice, almost twice the amount of sugar as a jelly donut. And the last one, frosted flakes versus Low fat frozen yogurt. You're probably on to this by now. It's actually the frozen yogurt. Add again, more, more than twice the amount of sugar. So 
that's really eye-opening. And I hope it illustrates the point that uh, it's really hard to tell just by looking at food what has the most sugar. And that's, and I hear that a lot from people when they say, don't eat that much sugar, because most of us have the concept that sugar is that stuff you, you pour out of the sugar bowl. And sadly, so much sugar has been dumped into our foods that it's sometimes hard to tell. But this is the kind of thing that you need to look at through the course of your day. You understand how it can add up. So as a matter of fact, let's take a look at a typical day. So let's say this is breakfast, orange juice, yogurt, and a bagel. So if we take the sugar from those three items, seemingly very small, they add up to 12 and a half teaspoons of sugar. And at lunch, let's say you're going to go to Panera and you're having me one of my favorites, Asian sesame salad with French onion soup and a baguette. You're adding four more teaspoons of sugar. And at dinner, this was one of my all-time favorites for a long time, the sweet onion chicken teriyaki wrap. Just that, you're going to add another three and a half teaspoons of sugar. So if you add all those up for the day, that's 20 teaspoons of sugar, which is almost a half a cup. And that's if you don't eat anything else in, in, in your day, just those three meals. So how much is too much sugar? Um, that's, the, that's the part that um, I really want to um, help you understand because it's a very confusing, I think, in that on average, Americans consume about 19 teaspoons of sugar, which is 79, or sorry, sorry, 76 grams per day. This is added sugar, by the way. Um, and the American Heart Association wants us to have, as women, no more than six teaspoons of added sugar a day. For men can have a little bit more, nine teaspoons. Um, and children, it depends on their age, of course, but um, no more than six per day. Uh, again, and that's of added sugars. I'm not talking vegetables and, and fruit, I'm talking the, those added sugars. And I think what gets confusing is because you'll see on the package, sugar is listed as grams. And most of us think in terms of teaspoons. So the thing to remember is there are four grams of sugar in one teaspoon. Um, this is part of the handout that I gave you. So I hope it's helpful. And for those of you who are good at math, then all you need to do is divide by four. But <laughs> I personally like illustrations like this because it helps me understand. So the thing to do is look at that package label for the grams of sugar and then either divide that by four or you can find it on this little illustration about um, how many teaspoons that would be. And that, like I said, it's in the handout. So hopefully you can get that printed out if you need to. And uh, along with the idea of um, how much sugar you should have, the recommendation by the American Heart Association, I put on that handout as well. This is where becoming a package investigator becomes really important. And we talked a little bit about this last month in our packaged food class. Uh, the thing to remember here is that three out of four packaged foods, so 75% of packaged foods have added sugar to them. And they're sprinkled out throughout the entire ingredient list. So if you remember from the class we did last month on packaged food, ingredients are listed in descending order by weight. And so what food manufacturers can do is they can sprinkle sugar, different sugars throughout the entire list that add up um, to the total amount of sugar. So things like ketchup, You'll have to you'll, you know, kind of dig through the ingredient list for the sugar. Even a ranch dressing, which isn't sweet to the taste, has sugar in the ingredient list. And this, this is my all-time favorite, I guess, surprising one, I guess I should say. Um, cheese slices. These are fat-free cheese slices. And if you can see at the top, they're recommended by the American Heart Association. And they have corn syrup in them. So sugar is sneaky. Even something like this, you would consider to be a vegetable product, has three different types of sugar scattered throughout the entire ingredient list. So that's why it can become overwhelming and you can almost feel like giving up because some sources will say, well, there's 46 different names for sugar that food manufacturers can put in food. Another resource I found said there's 61 different names for sugar. This one said there's 65. 
and then on this one says there's 96 or sorry 98 names for sugar and hidden sugar in food that you might see in the ingredient list which is crazy so instead of trying to memorize all of those that's this is the second handout um, that's in the chat box that I uh, we put in the chat box for you because what I tried to do with all of those is break them down into categories so you don't feel like you have to memorize them all. The two big ones that hopefully are easiest to remember, anytime you see the word syrup on the ingredient list or obviously sugar, those are sugar sources. Um, the interesting thing is sometimes they will leave the word sugar off of the sugar and they might just say turbinado. So it might be a good idea just to glance through those types of sugars. Then if you remember back to junior high English, the suffix, so the word, uh, the letters at the end of the word, O-S-E, for example, there, those words that end in O-S-E are all sources of sugar. So anytime you see an O's, it's a sugar. Um, the other two categories aren't that big. Saccharides aren't that big, and the dextrins and the, and the aces aren't, aren't big categories. But again, so a way that you can just tag a word without having to memorize it. And then the two categories of juices or juice concentrates. Anytime you see those, it's a sugar. Malts, nectars, and starches, those are all sugars. And then there was this, this outlayer group that I didn't know what to do with, honey, honey and caramel and those. So that might be worth just kind of almost memorizing. But hopefully this gives you an idea of how to find sugar in an ingredient list because it can be scattered throughout the entire list. And also on that handout is a little uh, part at the bottom on artificial sweeteners. So to find and identify an artificial sweetener, you would, the most common would be to find the ITOL at the end would be an artificial sweetener. There's some bizarre names over on the, on the right that I have there. Sucralose is a really popular one right now. And so is stevia extracts. And then we're gonna talk just a minute about those. Um, but basically the easiest way to know if a product has artificial sweetener is just to see if it says sugar-free on the label. If it says sugar-free and it's still sweet, it's gonna have some artificial sweeteners at, at some level in there. Now, I'm not saying artificial sweeteners are bad. Um, and, and, and Ashley and I are not even saying sugar is bad. We just really want you to understand what's happening in your body if you choose to, to eat them and what's going on. And so with, with artificial sweeteners, I just think it's important to understand what's going on when you eat them or if you choose to eat them. By design, artificial sweeteners are hundreds of times sweeter than sugar. And so one of the things I love is this picture because it reminds me of how close my tongue is to my brain. Because back to the, um, when insulin gets dumped out, anytime your tongue tastes sweet, your brain sends a signal to your pancreas that says, hey, there's something, there's sugar, there's sweet, something's coming, create insulin, get ready for this. And so that's what, that's what happens even with artificial sweeteners. And the thing there then is that back to this bloodstream that we looked at earlier, when you put artificial sweeteners in there, insulin's gonna come out, like I said, and no matter where your blood sugar is, either high or low or somewhere in the middle, insulin will go ahead and drop your blood sugar even further. And we get back into that same crazy cycle, that hormonal, I can't control my choices type feeling. and I don't know, maybe you've heard before, if you drink a Diet Coke, you'll eat your calories anyway. That's kind of a popular saying with diet sodas. And this is why, because a lot of times you'll get in that hormonal position that you are in a low blood sugar position and you aren't able to make the best choices. So artificial sweeteners can, can have that effect on people. And they do for me. If I if I start my day off with something sweet with artificial sweeteners, I really, I just want sweet all day long. So I've just really taken them out of my diet for that reason. The other reason when I was preparing for this is artificial sweeteners, I came across the term excitatory neurotoxins and I, excitotoxins. And I had seen that word before and I thought, oh, that's just an inflammatory way to get people not to, to eat artificial sweeteners. But really it's not. 
It's in PubMed. And if you're not familiar with PubMed, it's a, it's a search engine for all scientific literature. And so excitatory neurons, excited toxins in food was, was an article that was right there when I searched for it. So it's just something to think about as you're eating, if you choose to, to use artificial sweeteners and the impact they're having. And then real fast, I really do want to take some time to just look at stevia real fast because it's so popular. And I want people to understand stevia is a plant and it by itself is 200 times sweeter than sugar. Um, and it, so it does it in that it's not also supposed to in, impact your blood sugar. And it does that through, because it's a plant with this compound that I'm not going to try and pronounce. That would be great, except what has happened with this sweet compound from Stevia is that some major food manufacturers and agriculture companies have gotten a hold of it and they've put it through an extraction process. And so they've come up with the compound called Reb A, which is their product that comes from Stevia. So in its dried form, they take Stevia and they put it through, it's, it's over 40 processes steps to, to process this dried herb, sweet herb, and they sprinkle it with all kinds of things to get this Reb A at the end, which consumers like because it's a nice white powder that reminds us of sugar. So that's how we get stevias. And it's important then to still look at the ingredient level labels because you see erythritol, the ITOL, that's another artificial sweetener that's combined with this extract now. So it's a stevia leaf extract that you have to be looking for on the label. Um, and it just depends on how it makes you feel when you eat them. Even organic brands, you know, can even though they start as an organic product, which is a better perhaps um, plant because it doesn't have the pesticides on it, it can still have other things added to it. So I have not personally tried this product. This is supposed to be the, the stevia, just stevia um, leaf that's supposed to be the better one for you. So that might be something to look for if, you, if you'd like a better stevia product. Or because now that you know stevia is, is a leaf, it's green, I haven't tried this product either, but it's it obviously hasn't gone through the extraction process to, to turn into that white color. So that might be something else to look for. And one more thing on artificial sweeteners. Personally, my jury is out on monk fruit. I know one of the resources I'm gonna recommend, the Flav City guy, he likes monk fruit because it's not supposed to have the blood sugar impact that um, regular sugar does. So they say it's zero on the glycemic index but it's still an extraction process product. It comes from the, this little melon there you see. So it, it has a plant as it's, um, it originates from a plant, um, but it can also still have some artificial sweeteners to it. So jury's out on that one. Okay, one, before we get to the um, tips and ideas, anybody have any questions about artificial sweeteners or anything? We'll give everybody a few minutes to kind of enter in their questions if they have any. Um, I know that Rhonda mentioned when we started, um, this is not a, we don't think you should have sugar. We don't think you should try have artificial sweeteners. It really is more about the information about what that's doing for our bodies and how our bodies are reacting to those. Um, I have, you know, personally, I have taken my sugar intake down significantly um, because of the knowledge I've learned from like Rhonda and doing some research on my own um, and finding some replacements, which we're going to get into next, which is really what I know we all need to know um, is how we can kind of find those healthier alternatives for those sugars. Um, I still don't see any questions from this section. So why don't we go ahead and okay. move forward? Great. All right. So tips and ideas. Here we go. Number one, I think it's easiest just to use the nutrition label first because sugars have to be labeled on there. And this is when you'll go to the middle of the nutrition label, right to the carbohydrate section. And as we talked about carbohydrates in the very beginning, see that this, they could have some fibers in there. That might be because they're part of a complex carbohydrate, but this is where you'll see the total sugar and the added sugar. So that's a good place to start. And then you can use the divide by four 
to figure out how many teaspoons are in there. Oops. So that, that's that's the easiest. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Nope. Nope. I just had two questions that came through, and I wanted to get sure. them in before sure, sure. we have too far. Too far. Sure. Are there any health concerns on stevia rather than the insulin insulin and extraction? So, are there any health concerns regarding stevia? None that I've read. I, 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 like I said, I try not to use those in general because it doesn't make me feel good, but it, it would just be if you were concerned about how they put it through the extraction process. And okay. then if, if you're somebody who uses it and you feel fine with that, I, 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 don't, I don't know of any. So, And then question. the other question I received was regarding the sugar alcohols. Uh -huh. um, and we didn't really cover those, but we can kind of briefly go through a little bit about how sugar alcohols also kind of play with our body. Yeah, same idea. Anytime your, ta your tongue tastes sweet, the insulin response is a possibility, you know, depending on where your blood sugars are and what's happening in your body. So it's really, that's the bottom line for all sweet. Anytime your tongue tastes sweet, insulin can come out. The other thing with sugar alcohols, I will say, is they can have an impact on your gut. And the, your gut microbiome can, can get thrown off by sugar alcohols. And so that might be something to consider too. If you have any IBS symptoms or anything like that, it may not be the best thing for you. It's just something to think about as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, good, great, great, great question. So, all right. So number two, after you've looked at the food label, it's very safe to just assume all fast food and packaged foods have sugar in them. I mean, just really, it's just the way to go. So you might see something like a shamrock McFlurry and <laughs> compare it to your Frappuccino. There really is no difference sugar-wise between the two. They both pretty much have the same amount of sugar. Um, but when it comes to some packaged, like savory things, you wouldn't think they have sugar in them. But sure enough, Doritos do, and even McDonald's French fries have some sugar in them. And this is where it can get tricky because those don't come with a food label. So we're, we're just going to kind of assume that a lot of these products, well, anything has sugar in it. Then one of my biggest pet peeves are the imposter health foods. So protein bars, we saw an example of early on. They're trying to sell you on the fact that it's protein. But if you go to the look at the sugars, there's more sugar, grams of sugar, than there are grams of protein in this. So that, depending on your activity level, may not be the best food for you. Um, yogurts are another imposter health food, I think. People eat yogurt thinking they're being healthy, but so much of them have so much sugar in them. So this is just really something to look out for, not assume it's a healthy product. Cereals and oatmeals. Those again, they can be very good complex carbohydrates, but when you go to, to eat them in a packaged food like this, they can just have tons of sugar in them. You know, so something to do instead of that would be to just make your own oatmeal. So you know it's that good complex carbohydrate and add your own fruit would be a good way to control it. Or use a, a muesli instead of a granola because muesli is supposed to be um, sweetened by, by fruit, which you'll notice it does have some sugar in it, but no added sugar. But the thing with these is you gotta watch the serving size because a quarter cup is just so small. So think of that. And then we talked about it last month. Be very careful if you're going to use a dried fruit as part of your oatmeal sweetener because even dried fruits can have sugar in them. So we went through these last month with the, with the packaged food um, class. So even like a, a less sugar, um, cranberry is going to have then sugar and artificial sweeteners to it. And then the, the store brands are, are tricky, I think, because you have to kind of search through the food label to find the sugar, but almost all dried fruit will probably have some sugar on it. So take a look. Salad dressings, another imposter health food, because we think um, we're being healthy when we eat a salad, but it's the dressing that you have to be careful about. Um, my tip there is Ranch dressings or creamy dressings will have less sugar. Uh, we won't talk about the oil that's put in these, not, not, this, not this class anyway, but um, a creamy dressing will have less sugar or really I, I try and make my own. That way I can control what kind of oil I use and, and how much sweetener I, I want to put in it. Breads and bagels. We, we talked a little bit about whole wheat last month when we talked about 
food labels. This is tricky because it's only three grams of sugar, but it's per slice. So if you're having a sandwich, that's six grams of sugar. So that's, you know, that's over a teaspoon just in the bread itself. Gluten-free is another health term that you gotta be careful with because the sugar can still be off the chart with things like this. So watch that. Crackers, again, savory foods that you wouldn't consider, you even think would have sugar in them, they do like these, these wheat thins have some sugar in them. Sauces and spreads. Uh, barbecue sauce is notorious for high sugar. And because you only get two teaspoons in a serving, that's 16 grams of sugar. That's four teaspoons in, in that. So that's crazy. An idea here is to go for mustards. Mustards don't have sugar. Mayonnaises, um, if they're full fat or make your own, again, mayonnaise. Or instead of like a teriyaki sauce, a really good alternative for that is something like a coconut amino. So that's a good alternative for some of those um, sauces and spreads and things. Frozen meals, again, another tricky place for them to hide sugar. Uh, hopefully common sense tells you sweet and sour chicken would be a place to look for sugar, but there's a lot um, in some you wouldn't expect. Soups, soups are another place where they hide sugar. It's very surprising to people. So it's always worth taking a look there. And pasta sauces. These are notorious for lots of sugar. And we, we like our pasta sauce sweet, or we've grown to like it sweet, at least. But one of the things I've learned is to look up on the shelves at the grocery store for whatever reason, probably because um, the other brand, I, I think you can buy where you put your product in the grocery store, right? So the better brands cost a little bit more, um, they're actually higher on the shelves and they tend to have less sugar. So if you're looking for a better brand, try looking up on the grocery shelves. Okay, tip number three, please beware of your beverages. Um, this is tricky because um, you could, they can hide so much sugar in, in a liquid form and you don't even know you're drinking it. Even healthy things like this coconut water, um, it seems healthy, but it's got sugar in it. And my tip here is that if there are calories in a beverage, that means it has sugar in it. Or if it's a zero calorie or sugar-free beverage, that means it has artificial sweeteners in it. And real quick, we've got to talk about alcohol because this is something that um, you may not be aware of and you may be consuming more sugar than you realize. Um, if, and again, I'm not saying alcohol is bad. I just want you to know what, you, what you're consuming. So this, for instance, apparently salt, seltzer waters, spiked waters are very popular right now. And alcohol in general, what I want you to understand is they, they have a whole separate labeling laws for alcohol because alcohol is not regulated by the FDA. So this label, this nutrition label for this white claw hard seltzer here, you see it. It's zero carbs, zero sugar, zero added sugar, but it's 100 calories. And they're not required to put their ingredient list on the, on the um, container either. But if you, you can find the ingredients and you'll see it's got cane sugar and raspberry juice concentrate in it. So it's got sugar in it. And those 100 calories, yes, some of them are coming from the actual alcohol, but some of them have to be coming from the sugar as well. So... That's very confusing. There's a lot of debate about how your body uses alcohol, whether it digests as a, as a carbohydrate or a fat. Bottom line, your body has to use those, those calories somehow. And so I think it's really important to understand that even for wine, you'll see that it's like listed as three grams of carbohydrates. And that technically is the sugar that's left after the fermentation process, but it still has 120 calories. So you've got to ask yourself, where are those 120 calories coming from? So I think that's really important to understand. Um, so just take a beverage inventory. For me, I don't like to drink my calories. I like to eat way too much in order to drink them. So, you know, just take a look at what, what you're drinking and, and whether or not it's got a lot of sugar in it. Restaurants are notorious for wanting you to fill up on beverages because it's a cheap product. Uh, Again, with the big gulps and things, those, those things add up very, very quickly. So you just have to decide what are your favorites and, and what do you want 
um, to drink the most and it, it, is it worth the sugar? You know, good idea, anything clear, clear water, clear coffee, clear tea, green tea, uh, infused water is a great way to do it. My water today I'm putting, I, I just put cinnamon. I just sprinkled cinnamon in my water and I drink it that way sometimes. So, cause I like a little flavor too. Or if you choose um, a bottled beverage, that's fine. Unsweetened should be a key, but I would always double check um, with the ingredient list for sure. And Ash, I don't know if you want to unmute and talk, talk about your favorite here for a minute. I don't have too much experience with this one. So Spindrift is one of my favorite um, specialty drinks for me. Um, this is a, so it's a sparkling water. Um, but it is flavored with real fruit. So you will see that there are calories and there, there are sugars. But if we look at that um, ingredient list, it's coming from pineapple juice. And so th this is really my substitution for when I'm at a party or something, I will bring Spindrift with me so that I have something that I feel is a treat to drink that I know where my calories are coming from. I know like that it's how my body is going to react to it. Um, and I personally just think that they're really fun. They have some really great flavors. Um, and most of them are, you know, I think the highest caloric one I've seen is like 15 calories. And some of them are as low as two or three calories. And that's for the whole can. So you can drink the entire can and that's how many calories you're getting. You can read the ingredient list, seeing that it's nice and clean. And so that's just one of the ones that I've also suggested for those people who are looking to get off of alcohol, if they've been drinking a lot of those alcoholic seltzers, this one is a good one to kind of transition yourself from. Um, and if you were a part of the class last month where we talked about natural flavors, flavoring, um, this one doesn't have any natural flavoring. It all comes from real fruit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah. a great, it's a great alternative, really. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, great. Okay, number four, tip number four, rethink your first meal of the day, please. That This is a really good way to set yourself up for success. Instead of a, a typical breakfast that, or first meal, I should say, that looks like this, you know, aim for something that's got some proteins and some carbohydrates, some complex carbohydrates in them. And, um, you know, maybe even some vegetables is a great way to start your day because the point is to keep ourselves, to keep our blood sugar from doing this, right? We want to get off of this roller coaster of blood sugar. And the best way to do that is to start your day differently um, so that you've got this slow and steady up and down of your, of your blood sugar and not those crazy spikes. That's the goal um, throughout the day so that you stay that you feel stable and you can make healthier choices when you feel stable. Because, you know, we would never eat dessert for breakfast, but a lot of times it's, you know, a muffin and a cupcake. <laughs> You're actually getting more sugar from the Dunkin' Donut, Donuts muffin than you are from an actual cupcake. And, you know, so many people, again, grab that yogurt. We would never have ice cream for breakfast, but per gram, for the, an individual serving, they're exactly the same. So really rethink that first meal. That's a super important um, part of my, that has been a super important part of my success with trying to get a hold of my sugars for sure. And number five, we only got a couple more here. Start where you can, okay? If you're baking something, try and use half as much sugar and see, see how it tastes and see if your family notices. Um, the other thing in this, I would start with just using sweeteners that your body recognizes. So I use a lot of bananas and applesauce. Um, I, I will use sweeteners, but I try and, and stick with, you know, real maple syrup and then local honey, um, not, not the honey bear honey that you can get in the grocery store because those are easily doctored with a uh, high fructose corn syrup, but real honey or raw honey, um, maple syrup, make sure you're getting 100% pure maple syrup and not pancake syrup. Okay. But those are things that I, I feel like, you know, if I want something sweet, at least it's something my body recognizes. And that's kind of where I've kind of, that's kind of my rule, if you will, with sweet for me. Even if I want to cook with some, with real sugar, I will try and use a better brand of sugar. And just remember though, that if you're used to artificial sweeteners, 
real sugar may not really taste that sweet because artificial, remember artificial sweeteners are hundreds of times sweeter than, than real sugar. So just remember that if you're, if you, if you're used to a lot of artificial sweeteners um, and you want to choose a more natural sweetener because that leads me to my, my the next tip there is we, you need to retrain our taste buds a lot of the times. And again, our brains are used to that, that certain level of sweet. And so just, again, I, at this picture, I love it so much because my tongue, our tongues are so close to our brains and we're giving them, our brains are giving such a sweet message all the time that it's kind of hard to get off of. And then again, the whole dopamine release that still happens with, with the sweet taste. So that might be something you'll just have to give yourself some time to retrain your taste buds. Um, I use like I said, I use a lot of cinnamon and bananas. One of my favorites is just to take um, frozen fruit and add frozen bananas and then you know microwave it and sprinkle some sugar on the top because I know I like something sweet at the end of a meal, but I don't want to, you know, go too crazy. So this is a good alternative for me. And then and then Ash, I know you you do this one for your kids. So if you want to talk about that one a second. Yeah, so these are um, Hulk muffins that we do at our house. Um, and as you can see in the pictures, we use, you know, just your basic baking ingredients. So we have vanilla and baking powder. That bake container is salt. Um, so when you add salt to baked items, it actually makes the sweetness of those items come out more. Um, so we use, I use a little bit of salt in everything I bake to make it taste sweeter versus adding sugar. Um, we use almond flour and I do put some protein powder in there. The protein powder does have artificial sweeteners, um, but you kind of make a adjustment for those. And then really the sweetness comes from the bananas and the applesauce that we use. Um, and it, these particular muffins have six to eight ounces of fresh spinach in them. Um, and so you blend it all up and mix it all together and then you bake them. And my kids love them. And sometimes I'll top them with the uh, organic uh, cocoa nips. And sometimes um, if we're going for a little bit more of a treat, we'll put like five or six mini chocolate chips just on the top before they go in for baking. Um, so you kind of get that chocolatey sensation right as you're biting into it. I don't really ever put chocolate chips in the batter because you end up with way more chocolate chips. Um, but if you just put, you know, even four or five on the top, especially of the mini ones that are in this picture, um, they are a great, great little uh, treat for my kids, but they love to eat them for breakfast um, or after school when they come home. I will send the recipe out um, as well, so. Awesome, I love these. And, and what a great way to get some spinach in there and some color too, right? Oh. Those phytonutrients, I, I just love these. It's, they think a they great are idea. best. <laughs> it's a great idea. And Great idea. Yeah. Oh. Okay. And the last thing, last thing we got here, and then we, we, we've gone over just a little bit, but I just, I want to really bring to your attention to the other lifestyle factors that can contribute to wanting sugar and wanting to eat sugar. And a lot of these revolve around stress and not sleeping. Again, it goes back to that stress response with the cortisol. If our bodies think we're under stress and we need to fight a fight, we're going to crave sugar so that we're ready. We've got energy for that. So even if it's relationship stress, our bodies still feel there's something going on. So be very, you know, cautious of that and understand that, gosh, I really want some sweet and maybe there's something else going on that needs your attention. Exercising. Obviously for exercising, your body can use more of those quick carbohydrates, but to what level, right? We've got to really balance that out because even those, those quick uh, carbohydrates, they burn really quickly. And if you're eating too many of them, you're not going to tap into body fat, which many of us want. So it, that's just something to consider as something that might make you crave, 
crave sugar, if you're over exercising is another stressor. And then sometimes just simply being dehydrated can make you crave, well, food in general, but can really make you crave something sweet. So all of those are other lifestyle factors to consider along with the very thing we talk about, um, our gut microbiome. So if you've ever, if you've got gut issues, if you've been diagnosed with IBS or any of those other conditions, there's a good chance that your gut, the, the bugs in your gut are off balance and you've got more bad guys than good, or maybe you've got more yeast down there. And those, they will send signals saying, eat sugar, eat sugar, because that's their preferred fuel too. They like sugar. So my point here is that there's a lot of reasons why we crave sugar. So if we can do what we can to bring some of those other things in control, then that might help with some of the cravings there. So I'll leave you with a couple of resources you might want to look into. Uh, Dr. Jason Fung, I like his work a lot. Uh, any podcast he's on, I like to listen to. Um, he's just, he explains things in a very easy to understand way. He, he's written a couple books. He was a a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, and he got interested in this when he was helping so many um, diabetes patients um, get help. Um, so these couple books are good. These books by Mark Hyman I mentioned last um, last month I think are great resources to help you understand um, what food is doing in your body. And then my Flav City guy, I still like him. He just <laughs> he he loves monk fruit and he, he he's a proponent of it. And I'm not not a proponent of it. Um, just know that he's, he, and he looks for sugar and food too. So I, I still think he's a great resource um, to be able to look at those. And then the handouts, I hope were helpful um, to helping if you were wanting to make some changes um, in the sugar in your diet. So with that, I think that's it. And if we have any more questions, I'll- We do have some really great and, questions. Um, so the first question to, I have is, What's a good rule of thumb for how many sugars is a good target number for yogurt? So if you're looking at a yogurt, um, what would be a good target number for sugar in there? Well, if the American Heart Association recommends no more than six added sugars per day, you know, uh, it, I, would, I would look for anything that's, you know, five or less. <laughs> six or less. And if that's, if that, if yogurt is really important to me um, and I'm eating that as part of my meal with some protein and some healthy fats, you know, it's just, I don't know that there is any like great number. Um, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question <laughs> because I wouldn't want to spend my sugar grams on yogurt because I don't necessarily like it, but if it's important to you and it's something that you're adding with another part of your meal, you know, I would say five or six grams is not a horrible amount of added sugar if it's got some protein in it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other ideas there, Ash? Um, I was just going to take a look at like a non-fat Greek yogurt. So, and then add your own fruit to it. Yeah. A non-fat Greek yogurt has five grams of total sugar, zero added in three quarters of a cup. So okay. I would say that that's a good place to start. And from there, if you added some fresh or frozen berries to that, mm -hmm. um, that would be also a really great way. Or the, um, what was the thing you were talking about putting on your oatmeal? The, was it muesli? Oh, the muesli. Like, uh, yeah, the yeah, muesli. A, mm -hmm. a muesli mm -hmm. on there like would also crunch. be really mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. as like that's a little bit idea. of crunch. Um, yeah. Good idea. To kind of like create like a yogurt parfait almost. Good idea. Great. That's a great idea. Yeah. Love that idea. Um, the great. other Any... questions we have are, do you think cane sugar causes inflammation in the body, including in the bowel? You know, sugar in general is just inflammatory. Um, that's the way it burns. When, it, when, when, when our bodies burn sugar, they produce <laughs> oxidation, which is like rust. So sugar, whether it be cane sugar, honey, all of those are inflammatory, which is one of the reasons why we want to, you know, put more of a cap on how much sugar we're eating. I know sodas and other companies have gone to saying, oh, we've got cane sugar and not high fructose corn syrup. From an insulin standpoint, 
are, your body is doing the exact same thing um, with cane sugar versus any of those other um, sugar, simple sugar sources. A simple sugar is a simple sugar is a simple sugar when your, when your body is concerned. So healthier, it's about the amount, right? It's, it's the amount that you would be having, you know, of either cane sugar or honey or any of it. Um, and then the uh, last question that we received, is there a preference to why cane sugar, like an organic cane sugar, is uh, your choice over a plain refined white sugar? Mm. I simply showed, I showed the bag of the organic cane sugar because one of the things that it would take out then are any pesticides or, or other chemicals that would, might come along with regular refined sugar. And so I just feel like it's a cleaner sugar for, for me. Um, it, it is more expensive. And so I wouldn't use it if I were going to like bake for a bake sale or something mm -hmm. like that. But for my own personal use, I would just use the cleanest, best sugar that I can. Um, and that's why I would use that one. But from a health standpoint, other than the, t the chemicals that might be involved with the refining process, I mm -hmm. feel like the organic one is just a little bit healthier. I, for myself and for my family, I almost all 